sink suit for perpetual injection. We divided it into three parts. The first relates to the institution of suit, the jurisdiction of the court, and the ingredients of perpetual injection. Now today we are going to study the second part of the perpetual injections. Second part relates to the fact and as to when injunction is granted. And third part relates when the injunction is refused. When injunction is granted, section 54 of Specific Relief Act helps us in this respect to understand as to when perpetual injunction is to be granted. It is to be remembered that the word given is not used here. Perpetual injunction when given and then perpetual injunction when granted. These are absolutely two different things. We are dealing in section 54 regarding the perpetual injunction when it is granted. So we have already seen that it arises in respect when we are to prevent the breach of an obligation. When there is an obligation on a party and the other party has a right and there is an invasion, a threat on the right of a party, the perpetual injunction may be granted. And the second part is when such obligation arises out of contract. When the obligation arises out of contract, what are the circumstances wherein perpetual injunction may be granted? When such obligation arises from contract, the court shall be guided by the rules and provisions contained in Chapter 2 of this Act. Chapter 2 of this Act relates to the performance of agreement. What are the contexts which can be performed specifically? What are the contexts which may not be specifically performed? and all the matters relating to the rights under the contract, relating to the performance of the contract, relating to the parties to the contract, who is entitled to file a suit for specific performance, against whom a suit for specific performance is filed. So all these matters relating to the performance of a contract are regulated by Chapter 2 of the, of the Specific Relief Act. So under Section 54, if we go through it, we find that when such obligation arises from contract, the court shall be guided by the rules and provisions contained in Chapter 2 of this Act. This provision is obviously very simple that Section 54 when gives the grounds of injunction when it is granted, then at the same time it transfers certain things from this section to the section 12 to 30. Sections 12 to 30 of the Specific Relief Act deal with the performance of a contract. So, when such obligation arises from a contract, it is regulated by Section 12 to 30 of the Specific Relief Act. So, when we are going to study the contract, the, some things are to be taken into account. Number one, the Contract Act. Number two, the existence or non-existence of certain agreements. 
the context which can be specifically performed and all those matters which have been provided in the contract act are to be taken together into consideration for the purpose of deciding as to what are those sections provide and the provisions contained in chapter 2 are to be followed for the purpose of determining whether an injunction is to be granted or not. The third part is when the defendant invades or threatens to invade the plaintiff's right to our enjoyment of property, the court may grant a perpetual injunction in the cases enumerated in section 54. This is one of the most important part of the section. It relates to the property. Now I am going to recite it once again. When the defendant invades or threatens to invade the plaintiff's right to our enjoyment of property, the court may grant a perpetual injunction in the cases given in section 54. Now the question is that the enjoyment of property and the right to property, these are two basic subjects of this part of section 54 and there should be an invasion or threat. What does the invasion mean? Invasion means to actually commit breach of a right. If somebody has the right to enjoy the possession of a property, anybody who is invading to dispossess him is an invasion on his right to possess. If a person is having the ownership in a property, any other body claiming himself to be the owner of the property and trying to enjoy the ownership of the property, that is invasion on his right. So the invasion of the right of a person gives rise to a cause of action to file a suit for perpetual injunction. And when he has got a right to file a suit for perpetual injunction, and if he proves that he has got the right in the property, that he has the enjoyment of property, the court may grant him perpetual injunction. And the perpetual injunction, as I have already told you, is granted by the decree made at the hearing and upon merits of the case, then what happens, the defendant is thereby perpetually enjoined from the assertion of the right or from the commission of an act which is contrary to the rights of the plaintiff. So section 54, this part, when the defendant invades or threatens to invade the plaintiff's right to our enjoyment of property, the court may grant a perpetual injunction. Or what are the cases? They are five in number in which perpetual injunction is to be granted. Meaning thereby that one of those five ingredients should be available for the grant. Number one is where the defendant is a trustee of the property for the plaintiff. Then there is an invasion or threat to the enjoyment of the property, the perpetual injunction may be granted. The defendant being a trustee is bound to account for it and he is bound to obey the rights of the plaintiff. And if he is a trustee of the plaintiff, he should not exceed his jurisdiction and if he is a trustee he cannot be allowed to invade the right of the plaintiff and when he is a trustee he cannot interfere in the enjoyment of the property of the plaintiff. If there is a threat or invasion on the right of the party of the plaintiff the trustee may be restrained from doing it. 
the trustee is to be refrained and perpetual injunction is to be granted for that purpose. Second is when there exists no standard for ascertainment, the actual damage caused are likely to be caused by the invasion. Now again, the invasion is a necessary ingredient. If there is no invasion or there is no threat of invasion, this provision is not applicable. It shall apply only in the circumstances when there exists no standard. If there is no standard to ascertain the actual damage caused are likely to be caused by the invasion. So there are two reasons. Number one, invasion. Number two, likely to cause any damage. And that damage is of this nature that where there exists no standard. If there is a standard for ascertainment, then of course this provision shall not be applicable. But when there exists no standard for ascertaining the actual damage because the invasion on the right of a person, the threat of invasion to the enjoyment of the property of a person gives rise to a cause of action. And this cause of action should be of this type that it can be established that there is no standard for ascertaining the actual damage. An invasion causes the damage. A threat to invasion may cause the damage. So the damage is a criteria for determining the question of grant of injunction. So actual damage, if caused, sometimes it may be compensated in the terms of money. And sometimes it cannot be ascertained. So when it cannot be ascertained, and nobody can tell how much loss this man shall suffer on account of the invasion on his rights, the court may grant injunction. It is to be remembered that the word may is used, the court may grant. Nowhere the word shall is used. It means that the court is not always bound to grant the injunction. The court may grant injunction means it is discretionary with the court to grant injunction. And this discretion is based upon equitable principles. This specific relief act, as I have already told you, is a, an enactment which relates to equitable reliefs. So all reliefs available to the specific relief act are active equitable reliefs. Same in the case with the perpetual injunction, it is also an equitable relief. And when it is an equitable relief, there is no question of share, because it is discretionary with the court to grant this relief under the circumstances that the equity so demands. If the equity demands that the perpetual injunction is to be granted, it may be granted. But if it is not equitable to grant it, then the court shall not grant. The word may is used in this section that the court may grant to prevent the breach. The court may grant for the purpose of obligations which are arising out of contract and the court may grant when there is an invasion are threat to invade the right of a person on the enjoyment of property. So the question is very simple. Where there exists no standard of ascertainment, the actual damage caused are likely to be caused by the invasion. The court may grant 
perpetual injunction. Number three, where the invasion is such that pecuniary compensation could not afford adequate relief. This part is very important. Now, what is compensation in terms of money? Why the compensation in money should be an adequate relief? Why it should not be an adequate relief? So, for the purpose of understanding it, we have to understand what is an irreparable loss. In other words, this provision contains that if there is an irreparable loss, then on irreparable loss on account of the invasion, the temporary, the perpetual injunction may be granted. Irreparable loss means a loss which cannot be compensated in the terms of money. Where the invasion is such that compensation in money is an adequate, is not an adequate relief, the court may grant injunction. But if the, it may be compensated in the terms of money, then the compensation shall not be granted. Now the criteria is, as to the invasion is causing irreparable loss, or is this causing such a loss which may be compensated in terms of money. If it is compensated in terms of money, so the compensation in money is an adequate relief. And if the money is an adequate relief, then the perpetual injunction shall not be granted. It shall only be granted if there is an invasion or threat to the right of a person in the property and the compensation in money is not an adequate relief, the perpetual injunction may be granted. Fourth is, where it is probable that company compensation cannot be got for the invasion. You may read these two portions C and D collectively and also in isolation and separately. Where it is probable, in the first part the word probable is not used. Where is the invasion is such that pecuniary compensation could not afford adequate relief. But in this part they have used where it is probable. If there is probability that pecuniary compensation cannot be got, then the perpetual injunction shall may be granted. Where the injunction is necessary to prevent a multiplicity of judicial proceedings. So in order to avoid the multiplicity, injunction may be granted. But this section is not to be read in isolation. This section is to be read along with section 56. We shall read section 55 after 56 because section 55 relates to mandatory injunction while we are studying at this moment the perpetual injunction when diffused and when granted. So far as the grant of perpetual injunction is concerned, the grounds available in section 54 provide the right to a person that perpetual injunction may be granted to him. But so far as section 56 is concerned, it gives the grounds when the, compens when the perpetual injunction is refused. So we have to see, while we are determining whether compensation, sorry, when perpetual injunction is to be granted or not, then first of all we have to see, number one, that the plaintiff has got a right. Number two, there is an invasion or threat on the right of the person. When we find that the defendant be restrained from interfering with his rights, the suit for perpetual injunction may be competent. But when we come to this stage, 
that there is a suit for perpetual injunction. First of all, it is to be shown that whether there exists any ground to refuse it. First we have to see the refusal. Then if it does not fall within the refusal, then we have to see whether it falls within the grant. So section 56, if applicable to a case, section 54 shall not apply. The applicability of section 54 will come into play when 56 shall not be available. So there are about 11 grounds given in section 56 when injunction is to be refused. First of all I shall go through these sections before you and then one by one we shall study all the grounds. <laughs> An injunction cannot be granted a to stay a judicial proceeding pending at the institution of the suit in which the injunction is sought unless such restraint is necessary to prevent a multiplicity of proceedings b to stay proceedings in a court not subordinate to that from which the injunction is sought. C. To restrain persons from applying to any legislative body to interfere with the public views of any department of the federal government or any provincial government or with the sovereign act of foreign government e. To stay proceeding in any criminal matter. f. To prevent the breach of a contract, the performance of which would not be specifically enforced. g. To prevent on the ground of nuisance an act of which it is not reasonable, clear that it will be a nuisance h to prevent a continuing breach in which the applicant has acquiesced i when equally efficacious relief can certainly be obtained by any other usual mode of proceeding except in case of breach of trust j when the conduct of the applicant or his agents has been such as to disentitle him to the assistance of the court. Where, K. Where the applicant has no personal interest in the matter. So these are 11 grounds where injunction may be refused. Now the word has been used, an injunction cannot be granted. It means that the injunction shall not be granted. In section 54, we saw that injunction may be granted, but in section 56, the injunction cannot be granted, meaning thereby that if any of the grounds mentioned in section 56 is available, injunction shall be refused. But if you get rid of section 56, then section 54 comes into play and you are to give the ground of section 54 and if you succeed in giving section 54 even then the court may refuse. Yes. So the power to refuse injunction is of two ways. Number one on the grounds given in section 56 and number two on equitable grounds, even if you have a case under section 54. If you are successfully making out a case and under any of the grounds of section 54, even then you are to satisfy the court 
that it is equitable to grant because it is judicial discretion of the court. But so far as 56 is concerned, there is no discretion. The court cannot grant. So in order to defeat a plaintiff, the defendant should bring the case under section 56. And in order to succeed a plaintiff, succeed, a plaintiff has to abstain from section 56 and also give the ground given in section 54 along with the grounds of equity in his favor. So the grant of perpetual injunction is dependent number one on the equity, number two on the ground given in section 54 and number three there does not exist any ground of refusal. So we are taking them one by one. An injunction cannot be granted to stay a judicial proceeding pending at the institution of the suit in which the injunction is sought. Unless such restraint is necessary to prevent a multiplicity of proceedings. This uh, part of section 56 has got three ingredients. Number one, there should be a judicial proceeding pending. Number two, it should be pending prior to the institution of suit for injunction. And number three, that there should be no need to prevent the multiplicity of proceedings. If there is a multiplicity of proceedings and there is a necessity to restrain it, then the court may grant. But unless such restraint is necessary to prevent a multiplicity of proceedings, you need to prevent the multiplicity, the injunction may be granted. But if there is no threat to this, then it shall not be granted. It means that ordinarily a, a suit to stay proceeding of another suit is not competent. It usually happens that certain persons file suits to restrain the revenue authorities from taking cognizance of the matters relating to the suit which are triable by the revenue courts. If a revenue court has taken the cognizance of a case before it, a civil court cannot grant injunction to stay those proceedings. If a suit is pending before the family court, a civil court cannot grant any injunction to stay the proceeding in the family case. If there is a rent petition pending before the rent table, the civil court cannot grant stay to stop the proceedings. In short, we can say, that the injunction cannot be granted to stay the proceedings before any other form. Because if there is a threat of multiplicity, then of course there may be certain situations wherein the injunction can be, may be granted. So I think this is all for today. The rest of the portion of section 56 shall be discussed, studied and explained inshallah on the next.